Drew, welcome to the show. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? Absolutely. Well, thank you first uh, for having me. Uh, and uh, yeah, my name is uh, Drew Tarvin, and I am, as far as I know, the world's first humor engineer. Uh, and that claim is based on Googling humor engineer. Uh, mostly you get jokes about engineers. Uh, and then like uh, you get me, you get uh, humor engineer. So I think according to Google, I'm the, the first humor engineer that uh, came out. And what that basically means is that I work with uh, individuals, groups, and organizations on how to use humor to solve human problems. So things like communication, uh, employee engagement, stress management, that kind of stuff, uh, solving those human challenges, but using humor as a way to do it. I love that. And you know that I love that. And I feel like, no, not I feel like, the what you do lends into build, building brand invincibility on so many levels, which is mm -hmm. why I'm so happy to have you and excited for this conversation. Can you give us more though? Can you yeah. tell? Because I'm sure that people are saying, yeah, what does, you know, ha what? <laughs> what? Yeah, what? still, yeah. What, is, what exactly <laughs> does that mean? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah so I'll, I'll explain it a little bit more by way of background, because I think sometimes that helps people kind of understand, because a lot of times people are like, what is a humor engineer? And it's like, well, clearly it's something that I just made up. Um, but it stems from, you know, uh, I've always been an engineer, so uh, I've always been obsessed with efficiency, doing things as efficiently as possible. Like, I believe the word efficiency should be a one-syllable word. It would be more efficient that way, right? <laughs> um, but uh, so I went to uh, The Ohio State University, got a degree in computer science and engineering, and then I spent six years at uh, Procter and Gamble as a project manager, working on IT projects and learning leadership skills and communication and all that. And uh, in college and university, I started doing improv and stand up. And while I was at PNG, I started to realize that the reason why I was being successful at PNG was because of improv and stand up training, because I had a way of relating with people and because uh, people actually read my emails and would actually want to come to my meetings. And so I started to explore that intersection of humor in the workplace, improv and business, happiness and productivity and started training on it. And I learned that there's actually tremendous benefits to using humor in the workplace, like that are backed by research case studies and real world examples, things like you can get people to pay attention a little bit more, or you can use humor as a way to manage stress. So you, uh, you know, increase blood flow through the body and decrease muscle tension and X, Y, and Z. So 30 plus benefits of using humor for an individual, uh, 10 plus benefits for using it as an organization, like increase in profits and employee engagement and all that. So I started blogging about it internally and then started a company called Humor That Works to basically work with organizations full time. And that's what I do full time now. So that involves going into organizations and learning, hey, we just did our employee survey and we found that everyone is stressed out because of the changes that are going on in the workplace or because of the brand stuff that is happening. Um, you know, people are, it's tough for them to manage stress. And when we increase our stress, we know, you know, we have an increase in sick days an increase in healthcare costs, a decrease in productivity, et cetera. And so, oh, okay, well, let's develop a humor strategy and do training for these individuals so that they can manage their own stress so that yes, stressful things happen, but it's not going to prevent them from being productive. Um, or it's not going to, you know, one of the things that I've discovered is that it is very difficult to be productive if you are dead. Uh, or if you feel like death, right? If you're sick and tired or burned out, stressed out, you know, worn out, uh, it's hard to be productive. And so humor is a way to energize us, re-energize us so that we can be more productive. It's just like one example that we do. But for me, it's working with organizations on what their challenge is and then specifically how humor type related things can help them solve that problem. Does that help and more? Does that give it, more background? It totally helps more. And it, it gives so much more context and it's so interesting to me. Um, and clearly to you. <laughs> um, so what if, what do you do when people don't feel like they're funny? Whether that's mm -hmm. management who now says, okay, well, if I have to implement this humor at work and I'm not a funny or humorous person, how does that apply to me? Or how can I still excel at that for all of the benefits that it rewards to both our personnel and to the business? Yeah, well, I think there's three things that are kind of important to to recognize around humor. Um, one is that humor is a choice. Uh, and so it is my belief that you are responsible for your own happiness, right? And your own job satisfaction is 100% your own responsibility. So it is entirely up to you to make sure that you enjoy what you do. And we spend far too much time at work not to enjoy 
you know, at least most of what we do. Uh, so start, it starts first with the choice, recognizing that you can choose to use humor. The second is that humor is a mindset. And so it's not necessarily about just being funny. You know, that humor is, is the definition of humor is technically a comic, absurd or incongruous quality causing amusement. Uh, but basically what that means is that it is something funny. Like a lot of times when we think humor, we think punchlines and funny and maybe, you know, stand up jokes, et cetera. Uh, and that is part of it, but it's also more broad. It's something that's maybe a little bit silly or something that's even just a little bit different to get people to pay attention or to do something. And so when we're talking about humor in the workplace, we're talking about a way of working that is effective, different, and fun. Um, so it's not making things funny. It's making things more fun. Uh, and then the last piece to, to recognize, and this is maybe the biggest aha for some people, is that humor is a skill. And if it is a skill, it means it can be learned. Right. And I know that because I am someone who has had to learn how to use humor. Right. I've done over a thousand shows as a stand up comedian, improviser, storyteller. And when I went to my high school reunion not too long ago and people found out that I did comedy, they said, but you're not funny. Because <laughs> I was I, growing up, I was never the life of the party or the class clown. Like, you know, I've shared before, like I'm very much an introvert. But it is a skill that we can learn to get better. And just like any skill with practice and repetition, uh, we start to improve by going to stand-up shows, uh, by working on it, or by learning some of the techniques, um, and just being also just being aware a little bit more. Because I hear all the time from people who are certainly funny, they say, oh, but I'm not funny. And yet, they've constantly made people laugh throughout their life. And if you can make people laugh, Right, that means that you have ha you have demonstrated the skill of humor at least at some point. It's just refining that process a little bit more, which is so fascinating. And so for people who are watching and saw you do this when you said mm -hmm. go to stand up, um, to give a little bit more background, uh, like what two weeks ago from the time we recorded this, mm -hmm. Drew challenged me to do stand up comedy, and I did my first bit. So I have two more to do in the next like week and a half. I'll have to figure mm -hmm. that one out. Um, only because I challenged myself to do three. Um, and yeah, so I stood up there for three minutes feeling like a very unsuccessful speaker, <laughs> <laughs> trying to make people laugh and didn't really succeed unless- uh, Well, you, you, got a, you got a couple of laughs and you got a lot of what you can't notice in a stand-up club like that. You got a lot of head nod and you had a lot of engagement, right? And so that's part of the other difference too of like, using humor it's not always about getting a laugh from the audience but it's doing things to keep people actually engaged so that they listen to you and and there's a great quotation i'm not even sure who said it i think it might have been jeffrey Gittimer who said that at the end of laughter is the height of listening hmm. and so we oh, like we that. can use humor as a way to get people to kind of pay attention to something and then once we have their attention we can tell them the say me maybe the important news or the important information that they need to know but and I'm, yeah go ahead no but uh, yeah, I was just going to say, and the idea of, of stand-up comedy is in the workplace, the metric isn't the same of what you would do for stand-up comedy. I, you know, we went to do stand-up comedy because it's my belief that if you go and do stand-up and you try it, that's going to be the hardest form of comedy that you're going to ever have to do. So then when you uh -huh. are speaking or when you are with the client or when you are with someone else, the, the humor piece is going to be a lot easier. And what you really showed me, and you got me excited. I mean, you, hands down to you because I was so nervous going up to that. I did it, right? And I had my little bit and I knew that there was funny in the material. I just, I couldn't find it. <laughs> I wasn't extracting the funny, but I knew it had potential for funny. And you sat down with me for what, an hour beforehand and got me really excited about it and finding, it just comes to you now. But to your point, you've trained yourself. You've, you've developed that skill. And from my perspective, somebody who likes logic and mm -hmm. strategy and connecting things and just pieces and data and all of that, which I know we align on, um, there is strategy and there's, um, there's an equation to funny, yeah. which I find fascinating, which means to your point, it is a skill. It is learnable. Absolutely. There is like, there's an art and science to humor, right? And so we can learn about the structure and the science of humor, um, things like putting the punchline at the end or uh, comedic structures like the comic triple, where a comic triple is where you share a list of three where the third thing is a little bit different. Um, right. So, for example, uh, in my bio, I mentioned some of the organizations that I work with. And I say that, you know, I've worked with organizations like Microsoft, Procter and & Gamble and the International Association of Canine Professionals. 
And that last item isn't necessarily always going to be like hilarious, not going like, to make people laugh, but it is something like, wait, what was that last thing? What did you say? And why do they uh, need money for dogs? <laughs> exactly. And is it, is it, you know, my, when I first got the inquiry from the IACP, uh, it was like, wait, is this an organization for dogs who have jobs? <laughs> or no, it's dog trainers, right? Um, but that's a, con that's a structural thing that we can learn and that we can reapply. Now, obviously, there's still an art to humor. And so that's the piece that you learn in terms of your own particular style. As you get better, it's like, oh, what's your take on the world? What's your point of view? How does your sense of humor come through? What do you find funny? How do you deliver it, et cetera? Um, and so both of those things are things that um, you improve by doing, by practice and repetition. The science, we can be a little bit more structured about. The art comes from the creative you know, process through doing it. It makes total sense. And it makes more sense when you start to actually dive into it and start mm -hmm. to learn it a little bit. Um, you said something earlier that I kind of want to zero or narrow in on. You said that when you were at Procter & Gamble, that you would host meetings, people would read your emails more than others, mm -hmm. statistically, and that they would want to come to your meetings more. There was a higher attendance at your meetings, yes? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, this is something that I think is very relatable to anybody who's listening who's a professional yeah. who has to conduct meetings, which is everybody who's listening mm -hmm. um, or watching. So what did that mean for you? What, did, like, what was it about your meetings, your, you know, the things that you did mm -hmm. that resulted in that? Well, let me ask, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll frame it and ask it as a question and then kind of give a little bit more background. But um, all right, let's say you have two meetings on your calendar for the rest of the afternoon, right? One of them, like the last couple of times you've been to has like started late, it's been like boring and you found yourself on the phone all the time. Um, like just on your phone or an email or whatever. Another meeting, we're gonna say it's scheduled at the exact same time, right? You, you double booked yourself. The other meeting, the last couple of times you've gone, one, it started and ended on time, maybe even ended a little bit early, but you also like had fun. That like the presenter like shared a couple of images that were pretty funny, or you ended up like actually getting to know your coworker a little bit more next to you. Um, or just the topic was presented in a way that you remember that you laughed a couple of times in the meeting. Which one are you gonna go to? Clearly a second. Right, the one that's fun. Yeah. And so what the, the benefit of, so not only is there a great benefit to using humor, say in a single instance of like, oh, I'm going to use humor. Um, I'm going to start this particular meeting off with a story so that people are kind of engaged and I get their attention. Um, there's great value to that, particularly, and maybe most importantly, if you connect that story to the topic of that day, right? It's not just here's a random story that was entertaining and now here's 59 minutes of boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> right, it should be somewhat connected. But when humor becomes a habit in how you do something, people start to recognize it as that pattern and so they want to engage with it, right? And so for example, from an email perspective, what I started doing was I started sending uh, jokes at the end of my email. So I'd send out a status report every single week on how we were doing on a project. And then at the bottom, I love puns. I love coming up with wordplay. Uh, at the bottom, I would include a PS and then I would make up a terrible pun related to whatever that email was about. And I started doing that and I did it mostly for me because it was more fun for me. And then one time I forgot to do it and I had like within an hour of sending out that email message, I had like 10 or 12 different responses that were like, hey, where were the jokes? <laughs> And so what that told me is that not only were people reading the, not only were they opening the email, they were at least scrolling to the bottom. Now, I don't know if they actually read the rest of it. Maybe they just scrolled to the bottom, but that at least got them to, to open it and scroll to the bottom, which is more than we can say for a lot of our emails. But it's because they started to know, oh, every week when I get this email, not only is it going to be something relevant in terms of our project, but also I'm going to get a smile or a laugh out of it. And same thing with meetings, right? There's small things. Like I, I, um, I remember learning that Hitchcock is um, in almost every single one of his films, like in the background or like somewhere he's like, he hides himself somewhere in the film. Maybe he's like walking by as a passerby. It's kind of the equivalent today is like Stan Lee in all the Marvel films. Um, but I thought that was really interesting. So I started adding an image of myself in every single one of my presentations. I would find some way to relate me training business analytics through this um, tool that we we're training and I'd figure out some way to, to tell a story or justify me being a, in a picture of it or I'd put my like silhouette somewhere in the background and it became a game where people like knew that was happening so they would pay attention to the slide so that they could be the one to catch like oh wait I see you there you are it was like a hide and seek where's Waldo type thing so it was just something that added a little bit of element uh, 
to the meeting that just meant like, well, this is going to, this is going to be a lot better than say some of the other meetings that I have to go to. So I'm actually going to attend. And it happened organically. This is your character coming out. Mm -hmm. It's your personality. Yeah. So it can be anything. And you did it initially because you found it entertaining or it made the task a little bit less dull for you, which was relatable. Yeah. So caught on. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is, and part of it started for me with, I remember pretty early on at PNG, I was in a meeting and I was like bored to death, right? Like it was one of the, I do not want to be here. And I'm like, like, uh, can I do anything else? The problem was that I was the one leading the meeting. <laughs> That's a problem. Right? That's if you an are, awful problem. If you are bored while talking, You've oh, got to imagine that the people are bored while uh -huh. listening. And so it became a thing of like, how do I make this more fun for me? Even if no one else likes it, how do I make it more enjoyable? And I still do this to, to that day, to the day. I like, there are certain jokes in my programs that sometimes no one laughs at, or maybe only a small pe uh, group of people laugh at, but I include them because I like them. Right. So like one of my, one of my favorite jokes from my TEDx talk, um, uh, if you watch the video, once I say the joke, the only person who laughs is my mom. Like you can hear her laugh in the video. <laughs> but the, the joke is that I'm talking about um, how humor doesn't replace the work, right? Humor, you still have to be an effective employee. Humor is how you do something, not just what you do. It's not like an excuse to not do anything. And so I say that humor is like the salt of a meal, right? And so you wouldn't eat an entire meal of salt because that would make you a horse. And do you want to be a horse? I say nay. And, I remember this. From yeah, here. <laughs> right. It's a silly joke, and I'll, sometimes I'll do that in, in a group of 500 people where I'm speaking at, like, where I'm doing a keynote, and like maybe two people will laugh, or maybe sometimes like no one laughs. But I tell the audience immediately afterwards, like, I don't care if you laugh at that one. That one is for me. Like, I love that joke so much because um, I think it's so silly and so dumb that I'm going to include that in my presentation, whether you like it or not, because I control what I talk about. Yeah. And it goes to, I love that because it comes full circle with your rule number one, which is, it is our choice. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And that's you taking ownership of your time and how you enjoy it, which mm -hmm. I love. Um, I was going to say something, of course. <laughs> um, yeah. So the simple things, so the, the part about bringing, you know, yourself into it. So those are tactics and tricks that worked for you to make it more enjoyable for you and therefore translated into having a reputation of enjoyment yeah. in the workplace. Um, it's about finding your own piece of you that does that. Like I can't even imagine being bored, giving a meeting. I know that that just yeah. never would happen to me because I would never let that happen to me. There's no, I don't like to be bored. <laughs> right. I never mind be the boring one um, to myself. That's even worse. Talk about, so for listeners and viewers who are sitting here and they understand they're relating, I want it, so you mentioned there are 10 or 20 um, personal benefits, and then mm -hmm. you mentioned that there's about 10 or 12 business ones. Yep. For those who require the buy-in, whether it's just from sit, listening to this and saying, okay, I've bought in. Mm -hmm straight through to, I need to get buy-in because this is interesting and our culture would benefit from this. Mm -hmm. Can you share some of those benefits? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and so, so from an individual perspective, um, there are kind of five key areas that I, I look at that humor improves uh, at a high level, right? Humor improves communication. It helps you build relationships. It helps increase your problem solving skills. It uh, increases productivity and it helps to strengthen leadership, right? And so within each of those five, there are multiple benefits. So from a communication perspective, uh, like I said, we can start a presentation off of the story to get people to listen, right? Because the average person sends and receives 112 emails per day and spends up to 80% of their time in some form of active communication, right? But if you're at, say you're at a conference or you're in a meeting and you're in your phone and the person next to you laughs, you like look up. You're like, wait, why did you laugh? What? I want to have fun. Where's fun <laughs> happening? Right? Yes. So then you pay yes. attention to the person that made them laugh and now you've gotten people engaged. Or from a communication perspective, you can help people uh, remember things longer. Uh, like, I don't know, in, in Canada, do you, do you guys learn Sokotoa? No, I didn't so anyway, to, um, from, but I'm not the person to judge everybody yeah, else. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you're not going to speak for all of Canada right yeah. now? Uh, <laughs> yeah. um, 
Well, so it, for me, it's a ge geometry thing. So Katoa is how you remember how to calculate cosine, um, sine, and tangent, right? So Sokotoa so stands for sine equals opposite over hypotenuse, cosine equals adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent equals opposite over adjacent, right? It's how you calculate these angles. And that's a simple mnemonic that I still remember, even though I haven't used that probably since high school, I remember it because I think Sokotoa is fun to say. <laughs> right? It's similar to like um, red sky at night, scaler, sailors delight, red, so, red sky in morning, in sailors morning. take warning. Yeah. Uh, or that um, you bow forward, therefore the bow is the front of the ship. Or, you know, the 31 days on the knuckles, if you ever learned that, where, you know, uh, when you count the months off January, February, March, April, May, et cetera, each knuckle is a month that has 31 days in it. Um, right, these mnemonics, there's something a little bit different, right? They're not necessarily hilarious, but they're incongruous to what we're normally thinking about, and therefore they help us remember something longer. Humor allows us to do that by telling a story or making some type of connection. So we can do that with our own programs. If there's something that we want people to remember, it's why so many different groups have like an acronym that spells out their like values or their system, right? Um, so we can do that for communication. If you want to jump to, say, productivity, there's a lot with productivity, both in terms of stress management, like we've already started to talk. Uh, but also they found that um, when you uh, add humor, some type of humor to a repetitive task, people become more productive at that task and they're willing to stay engaged in that task longer. So one example that I use is if, I, if I'm reading email and I start to get bored and the emails that I go through, then I start to read each of the emails in a different accent in my head. It's like, oh, okay. If That's this was, yeah, if this was sent to me by someone from France, what would that kind of like sound like? Uh, or German or, you know, whatever the accent is. And it's just something to keep myself engaged. And that helps me to stay engaged in the process a little bit longer. Or I listen to music while I'm doing things. Um, from a problem solving perspective, they found that in one study, they found that students who watched a 30 minute comedy video before uh, try attempting to solve a problem, they were nearly four times more likely to solve that problem than wow. students who didn't. And it's just because humor and creativity and problem solving, they're both about finding unique connections. And so if you watch a comedy video, you start to get primed for seeing these different connections and seeing things in a different way. And they also, when we laugh, we release serotonin and that process allows us to focus a little bit more and be more engaged. And so there's a lot of like physiological benefits, scientific benefits from it, uh, in addition to kind of like the psychological or social, uh, uh, more social benefits to it from, say, a leadership perspective. Uh, they have found that when leaders use humor, particularly in stressful situations, they are seen as being on top of things and in control, even if they aren't, right? But the fact that, hey, this is a stressful situation and this person a is able to appropriate, right? And this is an important uh, caveat. They're mm -hmm. able to appropriately use humor then people are like, oh, wow, they must be in control because in order for yeah. them to be able to use humor in this moment, it means that they kind panicking. of, yeah, they're not panicking. Exactly. Yeah. Which is great for crisis. There mm -hmm. you go. Or issue management. Yep. Well, not say crisis. I don't want people cracking jokes in the middle yep. of the crisis. <laughs> right. Exactly. But issue management. Sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as long as to your point, they're appropriate. Yep. Were those the five? Yeah, so those are across the five. Did I move? Uh, building relationships was the, the last one. So building relationships, uh, Victor Borg said the shortest distance between two people is a smile, uh, right? And that's partially because we as humans are primed with mirror neurons. So when we see someone smile, we are primed to want to smile back, and that can create a connection. Or when we share a laugh, we share that we're on the same side with something. Um, and we have this shared experience or this shared moment together. It's also a great way to build rapport because when we can make people laugh, uh, that th those people are like, oh, this person gets me, right? Like, so I was just on um, Ian Altman's podcast and we we're talking a little bit about humor and he shared an example of how someone that he was working with used to use um, humor when they would do cold calls. At the very beginning of the cold call, when someone would pick up, um, the person would say, hey, this is a sales call. I know those are terrible. You feel free to hang up if you want. And that's like so different, right? It builds rapport instantly because they're like, oh, okay, this person just made me laugh. And they understand that sales calls aren't fun, but because he just made me laugh, maybe I'm going to give him, you know, 60 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. Or the same thing of like, uh, I shared there the example of someone sent me an email and I hadn't replied like in a week um, just because it was like kind of a sales email. 
and he sent a follow-up email. I don't know if you know that uh, the meme of John Travolta, to, um, a gif of him from uh, Pulp Fiction, where he's just kind of like looking around like this. It's like okay. somewhat popular meme, um, okay. but it, but yeah, he sent it as, that was the email, was just of a meme kind of like looking around and it made me laugh because it's to say, hey, where are you? Are you going to respond to this? I don't know. He didn't have to type anything. He just showed that image and it made me laugh. So I responded, right? Awesome. Uh, so it helps as a way to build rapport and let people know that, yeah, I understand what's going on. I don't take myself too seriously and uh, we can be honest about things. And I, all of those, all of those, each of those five things have to do with crisis readiness and building in brand invincibility. I mean, communication, clearly, right? That was an obvious. Um, and not necessarily that you're going to be humorous in your crisis communications, but if you're, if you can build that rapport through communication and those relationships through communication more effectively in your every day, mm -hmm. then when issues pop up or, you know, God forbid you're faced with a crisis, then one, you have better communication skills mm -hmm. and two, you have deeper connection with those you're communicating with. There's more of a relationship there, which gives you the benefit, which gives the organization the benefit of the doubt at the yeah. onset of the incident. So I love that. And then, I mean, issue manage, that's clear. Uh, problem solving, that's clear. Um, your last one was building rapport. Was that your last one? Yeah, relationship. building relationships and leadership, and, and yeah, and, and and I think one of the things that you mentioned here is 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 relevant to talk about is when it becomes part of the brand identity, either for you as an individual or as your actual brand. Um, that all happens before, say, any crisis potentially takes place, and then people yeah. then are aware of what that persona is, what that yeah. brand persona is, or your individual persona is. Like, for example, one of my favorite brands is Nintendo, and um, Nintendo, their brand statement has nothing to do with video games. Their brand statement is to bring people closer together. Hmm. And they started out as a card company in the late 1800s, and then they have evolved over time, right? And you see it through their products, and they've had some great successes, like the Nintendo Switch right now is, like, rocking it. But they've also had some failures, and they have sustained through those failures because they've always been taking risks, but always through this lens of we want to bring people closer together, and we want it to be fun. Right. That's why they have the game systems that are all about the play with each other as opposed to uh, the best graphics that there could be. But because they've created that brand, they also know from their investors or from their people that support that group that if they have a product that isn't going to do well, it doesn't mean that it's going to be the death of the company, but that they're continuing to innovate and that we believe in that brand and they'll continue to, to uh, live that persona in a fun way. Yep. And the other part of, I love that, and the other part of what you do and how you communicate it in terms of value is, and which I love, is humor in the workplace so that your employees go home less stressed and can be more present with their families and with yeah. their loved ones, which even just mm -hmm. that, I mean, I say it all the time, one of my Christ ready rules is people above process and bottom line always. Mm -hmm. That's a demonstration of people first, just putting Absolutely. value towards that. Well, and I, I, and I think that stems from a couple of things. I, do, I believe that respect precedes results, right? When, yes. we, when we respect each other as humans, and the, and the, the crazy thing is, is that over time, and, and because, you know, the work has changed, right? And um, it, things used to be about efficiency. And in a straight factory setting where all you're doing is making widgets, um, then yeah, efficiency makes sense, right? If you can make, you know, 10 more widgets per hour, that in leads to an increase in profits. But now in a knowledge economy or even potentially an attention economy, things have changed. And your ability to like, your emotions now impact your ability to get work done, right? So if you're completely stressed out because of things that are happening at home, then you're not going to be able to be nearly as creative in the workplace or productive. Vice versa is also true. If you're incredibly stressed out at work, you're not going to be able to be as present at home. And when those two things mix, when one of those is out of alignment, um, one, there's a human element of like, we would hopefully want to fix that. And then as an organization, you're also not going to get as good of results because if you're, even, even if they're delivering at work, but things are terrible at home, there's going to be a breaking point where that employee then leaves and you have an increase in turnover or they're going to like you have an increased healthcare costs and they're going to go through things where they're going to be completely out. So there's like the, there's a, there's the colder principle of like, yeah, it helps you increase profit, 
to do this, but it's also kind of the right thing and good thing to yeah. do. Well, and it, they, they go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. When you do the right thing, when you put people first, profit is increased and productivity mm -hmm. is increased and it, it all goes hand in hand. It's when we prioritize the, you know, the profit or the productivity that it now there's an inconsistency and it doesn't connect. Yeah. Well, and, and humor is, a, is an important way to like, because one of the things that I'll sometimes talk about is the fact that we label people as resources, right? And I did this all the time as a project manager. It's listed on my project plan. It was listed on my project plan, resources, and then it had names. But when we think of people as resources, right, we, we equate them to computers or budget or that kind of stuff. And we start to forget that the other person on the other side of a phone call or the other side of a conference desk or the other side of an email is a fellow human being. And that maybe the reason that the email is late to you isn't because they secretly hate you, <laughs> but because they have a sick kid at home, right? Yeah. Or because they're going through something challenging. And so by using humor, we remind each other of our humanity. And when we have that, that rapport with people, we can, we can get better results, right? We can, be, we can follow up with that person and be like, hey, I know this thing is late. Is everything okay? And then can say, oh, yeah, whoops, sorry, just got behind, here it is. Or you can say, actually, you know, now that you say something, I've been having this challenge. And like you said, then it goes back to the yeah. people first. Yeah, it does. Um, so totally sidebar question. What would be the one syllable word for efficiency? Have you thought <laughs> that through? <laughs> shent? Shent, I think. Because oh, it can't just, be, can't just be like F. If. Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> if or fish. Yeah, so shint's the only one of the three. It sounds almost wrong, but shint. It does sound shint. It sounds like an almost inappropriate word. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> almost inappropriate. Right. There's no real definition attached to Yeah, but that's it. a good question. No one's ever really asked me that before, so maybe I'll have to, you know, if, if I'm going to point out a problem, I should bring a solution. Kind of, you know? sort of. Yeah. It's All starting right. to trend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to think about that. I'm going to awesome. think about that. Um, in your, I know that you provide, so for people who are listening and say, yes, I'd like to, one, you've said that I can be funny if mm -hmm. I, you know, learn it. Yep. And two, I understand the value that this would bring to my people, to our organization, to our resiliency, to our connection with our customers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are some guiding principles or tactical, you know, implementable things that they yeah. can work towards? Yeah, well, I think that uh, one thing that we touched upon that's, that I think a lot of times people kind of have questions about is we said, you know, it has to be appropriate humor. Um, and one of the things that can really help. Don't start um, an issue because you're being inappropriate. Right, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> don't, yeah, don't create a whole crisis <laughs> yeah. that you have to manage because you're inappropriate. And don't which is say funny that because you learned it on the, the Invincible Brand podcast. Right. Uh, I'm trying humor and there it was. But, <laughs> and, but that's a great point because that has happened. There are multiple stories of people who have been fired because of inappropriate humor. Or yeah. um, I was just reading a story about, uh, I'll have to send it to you because you might find it interesting. Um, I think it was in the early 2000s or maybe 90s of a guy who ran, who built up a like a diamond store empire and he did one speaking engagement for other people and he talked about how all of his customers were idiots because he has like these terrible products and he was trying to say it as a joke and it basically led to the downfall of that particular diamond company he got fired um and they had to like rebrand the diamond company and now it's back to being like relatively successful but it was created they from an to attempt manage. to be human wow um and there's a lot that like from that you can learn in terms of what not to do mm -hmm. um particularly about target so what that brings up though is that there are typically three ways that humor is inappropriate um and the three ways are first it is an inappropriate subject right so using humor is not an excuse to then talk about you know sex drugs rock and roll or whatever you know you normally wouldn't talk about in the workplace unless right? it's, it's not an excuse yeah yeah. 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 If it, it, yeah. yeah, if it's, it's, it's again, okay, yeah. humor is how you do something. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, if your brand is all about rock Heroin. and roll, yeah. of course. Yeah. <laughs> Heroin. Here we go. Yeah. If you're branding, if you're a drug dealer out on the streets, branding heroin, uh, stop that. Uh, yes. be a positive force in your community. Beautiful. Um, but Beautiful. yeah, it's a little bit different. Um, the second is that it is, uh, it can be an inappropriate target. So certain styles of humor have some type of target. Sometimes the target can be yourself, right? That's self-defeating humor. 
uh, which is good in high status positions. If you use it too much, it can be bad though, because then people start to think that you don't take yourself too seriously or that you're not confident or that you're throwing a pity party. Um, so you want to use self-defeating humor sparingly, but a target your, yourself as a target can be okay. Uh, but you don't want to like target your customers or target your clients. Um, uh, so that's, that would be an inappropriate target in terms of who you're trying to make fun of. Uh, and then the last one is inappropriate time, right? So this, is, this would be big within crisis of like in the middle of the crisis itself, maybe not the time to specifically like try to crack jokes, but as you're following up with the learnings, maybe you're using humor in a slightly different way. And again, not necessarily trying to be funny, but maybe you're using humor in a way to be, to show something a little bit different. And you're going to use um, what we've learned through the process through 10 cartoons. And they're just like more hand-drawn things to kind of show the process to, um, to be a little bit more engaging. Or maybe it's, here's the story of what we learned, right? And you tell it in terms of the story. And you can find areas, again, where it's not the people that caused it or um, the clients themselves that's the target. But maybe it's you in terms of your initial reaction or how you felt about things or whatever. Um, so as long as you understand those three things and you think overall positive inclusive, you're going to be okay. Right, so that's the key is think positive, inclusive humor. Thank uh, Ellen DeGeneres, right? I know we both have a shared love for Ellen. She's a great example of affiliative humor, which is like that positive, inclusive humor. Um, and so that's, I think, th something to keep in mind. The other thing that I, I share is, um, right, humor is a choice. And so the challenge with that is sometimes knowing where to start. And so my recommendation is, is look for one smile per hour. Every hour of your workday, what's one thing, one, even, even if it's a tiny thing that you can do that's going to bring a smile to your face or someone else's face, right? So you go, you're going into work in the morning and you have a long commute. Oh, how can I bring a smile to my face? Oh, maybe I'm going to rock out to some of my favorite songs or I'm going to listen to a podcast. Uh, you get to work and you start with email. How am I going to make that more fun? Well, let me send an email that includes jokes at the bottom or let me, you know, try to read each one of these emails in a different accent in my head. You go into a meeting a little bit later. What's one fun thing that I can do there? Oh, if I'm leading the meeting, then maybe I'll start with an exercise. Or if I'm in the meeting myself, maybe I'll take visual notes and do a little bit like they found that doodling actually can help you pay attention more in meetings. Um, so maybe I'll do that as a way to stay engaged. And then when you leave work, uh, yeah, maybe I'll listen to a comedy podcast or listen to the comedy channel on Spotify or Sirius XM so that I laugh and relieve some stress. And like you mentioned earlier, so that you show up more present for your family when you get home, right? What is one small thing you can do each hour to bring a smile to your face or someone else's? I love that. And then if it brings a smile to your face, it's probably relatable in some way. So if you share it, odds are it'll bring a smile to somebody else's face, which then has this ricochet effect of positivity. Exactly. And you don't even necessarily have to be the, to use humor, you don't have to be the creator of humor, right? So I say you can be the shepherd of humor. If you find, um, if you happen to watch a, a TEDx talk on the skill of humor of a guy who kind of looks like uh, Justin Timberlake from here to here, <laughs> Uh, which is a joke related to that TEDx talk. But if you find like, if you find a TEDx talk that you like or a comedy video or something, then share it, right? And the PS of your email, send it out to your team and be like, hey, um, you know, oh, by the way, this, this uh, talk really made me laugh and thought it was relevant to what we we're talking about the other day. Or, you know, especially when it can be relevant in some way, comedians have a great way of seeing the world and they can articulate ideas in interesting ways. And so if you see a bit that kind of relates to maybe your brand or something that you're talking about or whatever, you can send that out to people and you're giving proper credit because you're linking to something else. You don't want to take something and pretend it was yours, um, but you can be the shepherd of humor. You can share it. Yep. And offer that relief mm -hmm. too. Absolutely. Awesome. Any last words of wisdom that you want to leave people with? Uh, I think it would just be um, kind of a, a recap of, to me, what are some of the most important things for people to remember. Uh, the first one, the most important one to me is that humor is a choice. Um, and that if you are going in, if you're dreading going into work every single day, or if you don't like your coworkers, or you are constantly stressed out, it is up to you to make a change. And sure, that change could be a different job, but that's not what I train on. I think it's more a change in perspective. It's more of how can I take ownership of this and make things more enjoyable? How can I find small ways to enjoy my work more? Because it's not what you do, it's how you do it. So that's Absolutely. interesting. It's and I'll super add, important. Yeah. I'll add, I know you're going to add more to that, but I'll add to that and say that if you are leadership listening and you know kind of the flip version of that, you know that your employees or your team, some members of your team don't enjoy coming to work. 
every day, yes, it's on them. And yes, it is their responsibility to take ownership of that. But you're also the leader. And if you know it, then in my perspective, you have a responsibility as leadership to say, okay, what can I do? What can I bring to my meetings? What can I do to better understand this human, not this resource? And, mm -hmm. you know, try to make the environment because culture stems from the top down. And yes, we all take yeah. our own ownership. And I, I believe not just humor is a choice. Every single moment is a choice in our lives. Mm -hmm. We all own our lives. Um, or at least we should. Yeah. And yet culture comes from the top down and then goes back up. Mm -hmm. So as leadership, it's also another kind of angle to look at and take responsibility there. And what can you do to take mm -hmm. these wonderful tactics and pieces of advice and implement them? The culture. Absolutely. And, and you raise a really good point because culture is from the, you know, culture is not the values you write on the wall. It's how people interact with each every, every, every day. And that comes from the behavior that they see, right? And from, and that they do. And one of the things that I learned with PNG is that as I started using humor more, other people did as well. And I was just, you know, I was, I was a new employee and then kind of rose to the ranks a little bit, but imagine what different it would have been if it was a CEO doing that or my yeah. VP doing that, right? Um, because it does spread. And by us seeing leaders do it, we can, um, we can learn a lot more for sure. Um, and the, the other thing is that I, I ran a study because I wonder if, you know, if, if humor was so, is so valuable, I want to understand why people didn't use it more. And so I ran a study through my site. And the number one reason people didn't use humor in the workplace is they didn't think that their boss or coworkers would approve. <laughs> and so if people in your team aren't using humor, if they are like, if it's very boring and dry, you've got to look at yourself in terms of saying, what am I doing or what am I not doing that is causing people to think that they have to be a sterile version of themselves, that they have Jeez. to try to be a robot. Imagine. Um, in the and workplace. if you're listening and you can relate to that and say, that's exactly why I don't, I would challenge you and say, just try it. Try it with all of the, the things that you've warned against, right? Make mm -hmm. sure it's appropriate and all of these different things, but try it and see mm -hmm. the ricochet effect that it possibly could have. And also the freedom, like the freeing ability mm -hmm. that it'll give to you. For sure. So many people assume that they can't use humor in the workplace. I always assumed I could. That's the only difference. And the thing that I'll tell you is that uh, no one ever told me to use humor, but no one ever stopped me either. And they certainly didn't when they enjoyed your emails and they enjoyed yep. your, your presentations. Exactly. What were the other things that you wanted to leave with? Uh, the other things that I was going to say is um, start for, like, again, humor is a choice. Humor is an ownership uh, piece. And then the other thing that I think is really important is, is recognize that, like any skill, when you first start trying it out, there's going to be times that it's successful, times that it's not. Right? The first time that you tried stand-up, the fact that you got on stage and, got, and were engaging is a huge victory. Um, but did you get like punchline, you know, laughter every 10 seconds? No, but that doesn't mean you're terrible at it and you should never do it again, right? It's practice and repetition. The benefit of it becoming a habit or becoming part of your brand, whether it's a personal brand or kind of your group brand, is you get tremendous benefits as a result. That's when you get people really paying attention or really like buying in. And like, I've gotten, I got an email not too long ago where someone was like, hey, um, I love your stuff. I just bought your online course. Honestly, I don't know if I'm going to watch the online course. I think I will. Uh, I just wanted to give you money in some way. <laughs> because thank you for your service. Because thank you for your service. Yes. Because I love what you're doing. And we feel good when we can buy from a company that we really enjoy, whose brand we respect and we love what they do and they entertain us, engage us. We want to, or we want to help them out by being word of mouth and sharing it. And, awesome. or as an individual, we want to be like that, that person is amazing. I want to spend more time with them, but also I want them to go and be successful. So I want to do what I can to, to help them out. So when it becomes part of that, you know, when you become that habit, when you do that one smile per hour, not only does it help you individually, but it also helps collectively the group and uh, your long-term success. Absolutely. Where can people find and follow you? Because you are worth following. People need to <laughs> I mean, just your puns on Twitter and Instagram, and you give me a laugh every day. So. Oh, good. Good, yes. Yeah. So uh, the website for more on humor in the workplace is humorthatworks.com. That's where you can find out more on some of the programs that we have, a bunch of free resources there in terms of how you can get started, um, a weekly newsletter that goes out that gives a humor challenge and all that stuff if, if people want, because I'm very passionate about, yeah, I want to teach other people the thing that I've learned, which is how to use humor to be more effective. Uh, and then on social media, I am um, at Drew Tarvin for everything. So for Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, 
Um, LinkedIn might be Andrew Tarvin, but uh, yeah, it's just Drew Tarvin there. And uh, I post, yeah, I do try to post something fun or humorous or engaging each day. Uh, and certainly if that inspires you to come up with your own joke, one of the things that I love seeing is that people replying, whether it's on Instagram or uh, Twitter or Facebook, where they're like, oh, here, this joke made me think of this or, you know, that connection. It's all about, you know, creating a community of this fun because I like to laugh, too. So if you can help me do that, um, it makes me smile and I'm, I'm happy for it. Clearly you do. You read your emails with French accents. Right. Oh, it's amazing. <laughs> oui. Which, <laughs> bien sûr. Uh, <laughs> which is awesome. Thank you so much, Drew. And of course, links to all of everything that you've just mentioned will be. Oh, and you, hello, you have a TEDx talk, which oh, yeah. is 1.4 million at this point, something like mm -hmm. that, yep. something amazing like that views, and you have an amazing book. All of that will be linked to below this podcast or video from wherever you are watching or listening to it from. Thank Perfect. you so much for Thank you. sharing. Thanks for having me. Bye.